Welcome to Tabu. It's a show where we discuss tabu topics in the sunny island of Malta. So, hello everyone. Today we're going to be speaking to Dr. Chiara Frenda Bolzan, and she is my gynecologist. I'm Sophie, for those who don't know. So, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovaries, not the syndrome, when I was 16. And it's only until I started speaking to my friends that I realized that you're not meant to bleed <laughs> during a smear test, that the gynecologist is not meant to pat you up and down and comment on how many tattoos you have, and not meant to just glare at you and say, lose weight. <laughs> There's a number of underlying conditions that can lead to that. So, hello, good morning, Dr. Chiara. Hi, Sophie, good morning. All right. Um, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. Thank, thank you very much for, introduce, for inviting me on this amazing uh, um, podcast with, where you discuss all these amazing topics. Um, so, I'm Dr. Chiara, friend of Balzan. I'm Maltese. I uh, was... Um, I graduated in Malta as a as a doctor back in 2005 and I did my, my first two years of a foundation doctor in Malta and then I left for the UK and I did all my specialisation in the UK working in various NHS hospitals over there and I spent 11 years doing this career job and, um, and then one morning I decided maybe I'm going to return to that lovely island. <laughs> So, so yes, so so after 11 years in the UK, I've come back now to Malta and it's been four years that I'm back and uh, um, I've worked at uh, the the hospital, the public hospital at, uh, in Malta and in private practice as well. And currently I'm fully self-employed. I'm working in private practice as a gynecologist. I also help women uh, through pregnancies. I help them with their sexual health and I also help transgender men um, who still have got uh, female genitalia because obviously they do require gynae services as well. Wow, okay, that's amazing. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so I have a lot of friends that are scared to go to the gynae. So mm. a lot of people, whether they're um, part of the LGBTIQ community or just part of normal relationships, there's a lot of horror stories about smear tests and how they hurt. And even myself, when I had my first internal ultrasound, nobody prepared me for that. So it, <laughs> it was quite a shock. Mm-hmm. Um, so could you please demystify the process for anyone going to the gynae for the first time and kind of like what age should we start going? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think one mistake we do is when we assume mm. that that person knows what they're expecting. So... Um, yeah, I think going through a, to a gynae appointment, it's it's quite an intimate. It's it's more than going to your beautician, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> so it's a very intimate appointment. I and I, if someone tells me it's their first time going to a gynae appointment, I do tell them what is going to happen, what to expect, that everything is done by consent. Mm-hmm. Okay, that uh, they're in control, that if they need me to stop at any time during the examination part as well, um, it's important that they communicate that with me and I will stop. Um, you should not feel pain. Mm-hmm. You should not feel pain. Obviously, if you're there because of pain, then something might elicit more tenderness, more pain, and that's expected in a sense, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're there for a routine visit for a smear test, mm-hmm. these should not be painful. And if there is pain, we need to figure out why there is pain. Because obviously there's uh, people who have got vaginismus where introducing something into the vagina because of the pelvic floor muscles being very tight, that's going to be painful. Mm-hmm. But obviously as a specialist, if I encounter that, then I'm going to take steps to make sure that it's not more painful for that client, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you talked about LGBTQ. Mm. Sexuality doesn't have anything to do with going to a gynae appointment. It should not matter. Mm. It should not matter your sexuality, right? Because overall, you still have a vagina, still have cervix. So from my point of view, your sexuality is important as to your sexual health. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Who are you intimate with? But it doesn't matter whether you're gay, lesbian, trans, bi. It doesn't matter because the examination is going to be the same. Yeah. yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, for those who are struggling with the genitalia, like like, uh, genital um, dysphoria, okay, obviously I'll have to take different steps to make things a bit more easier for them for Mm -hmm. the examination. But but yes, indeed, um, I believe that it should be a space, a safe space, 
where you can communicate with your gynae that you're not comfortable with something. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question or maybe there's something that we need to clarify a bit more. Yes, um, it does answer my question for sure. I think as in re- with regards to the age, for me it was because I was getting my periods like once a year right. or for like two weeks straight and then nothing for three months. Mm-hmm. And obviously when I started getting sexually active, it was a bit... Um, scary because yeah. there were a lot of like pregnancy scares. Of course. But then I found out after going to the gynae that I've got a history of polycystic um, ovaries in the family as well. And there's a history of mental health. And mm-hmm. you mentioned um, the painful part for me, I think, was more related to anxiety mm-hmm. and depression. So it's it's mm-hmm. all it's all holistic. It's all connected, it's all you know. Absolutely. Um, but most people, unfortunately, well, this is the experience I had. They just have just they go to the gynae and she's like, oh, just take yes. Mm. So, and for me that I was so bad, I got so, so many side effects that weren't good. And then I took it upon myself to go online, actually research the side effects and realized um, in America, there were some studies that led to high suicide rates, for example. I'm like, okay, so before taking things, obviously you're ingesting them every single day, you should know what's going into your body and what the side effects are at the end of the day. Yes, there are the positives that they're, you know, contraceptives at the end of the day, Um that's a whole other subject, though. I, I have friends who tell me, OK, they're on the pill, so they don't use condoms, for example. They don't use contraceptives because it's like, OK, I want to get pregnant. But what about STIs, you know? Absolutely. So I don't think I think this is also related to the lack of sexual education in Malta. So for me, for example, when I was in high school, they just showed us a very graphic video on abortion and how they cut up babies from one month to nine months. And they're like, OK, that's your sex ed, basically. <laughs> So obviously, and I, I was in a co-ed school, so obviously, okay, how the hell do you expect us to know about contraceptives and how to use them and how to be, and consent? We should all be having a conversation about consent from a very young age, you know, and what it means. And there's this huge gap in Malta, you know. Yes. And obviously with the church then, which is a completely different um, <laughs> kind of worms there, a lot of people are scared to actually go to the pharmacy and buy certain things or to set up appointments. Um, and not everybody has insurance as well. So I have friends that they can't afford to go to the gynae. They just can't afford it because they don't have insurance. So there's a lot of things that are lacking that I feel we need to speak to about, you know. Wow, Sophie. So that's a lot of topics for me to <laughs> tackle a lot of one question. Yeah, yeah. Um, as to what age you should start seeing your gynae, um, have, if you have any period problems, then obviously you need to see a gynae because that uh, needs to be investigated and maybe regulated, okay? Um, but in essence, if someone has normal periods, no problems, no pain, no, no, no heavy bleeding and all of that, um, once they're sexually active, it's important to have that conversation about contraception. Um, in Malta, contraception is not subsidized by the government, so it needs to be bought by the person using it, okay? So whether it's condoms, they need to be bought by whoever is going to be responsible. And I do encourage my female patients to carry condoms in their in their purse um, because there is the, there is this almost culture in Malta. There's some men who refuse to use condoms. And going on to the subject of STIs, um, being on contraception, avoiding pregnancy, does not always mean avoiding STIs. Exactly. Okay. So there is contraception that tackle both, um, like the condoms, okay, because that's a barrier contraception. There's the male and female condoms. They do exist. Not very fun. (laughs) Not comfortable. I mean, hmm. That's it. Most of the time we hear from men, unfortunately, like, oh, it doesn't feel as good. And oops, I forgot it at home. So the female is left with, okay, should I, should I not? Should I, hmm? Oh my goodness. Okay, Do you know, yeah. this gives me goosebumps, right? <laughs> okay. So I, I've got a lot of gay friends. They will not touch another gay man without a condom. Mm. Because the thought is, what if he gives me something? Exactly. Right? Yeah. So why don't straight men think this? Why don't they think, what if she gives me something? Exactly. They should protect the little man, right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. we see a lot of men who don't. Yes. And unfortunately, I see a lot of repercussions about this. So I see patients who who are struggling with either chlamydia, gonorrhea, pelvic inflammatory disease. Oh my God. Because obviously it affects m- women more than it does men. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and 
And and it's not as uncommon as we think, right? Apart from that, there's HPV, the human papilloma virus, there's herpes, there is there is HIV as well because it is amongst us. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is this misconception that being on the pill increases the risk of cervical cancer. Bearing in mind that cervical cancer comes from HPV most of the time, about 90% mm-hmm. of the Which time. Is Which is sexually transmitted. Which is sexually transmitted. So the pill is not associated with an increase in that cancer, but because you're not using barrier protection, mm-hmm. then it's going to increase your risk. Um, so my advice is always, if you are in a relationship that is a committed one, you need to have the chat, right, okay, so when are we going to stop using barrier? Exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that means doing an STI screen. Mm-hmm. So making sure that neither of you have got any STIs to share between each other. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and that goes for for uh, for straight uh, couples as well as gay couples. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, w- we cannot say that this cannot be shared between lesbians because I also see STIs in lesbian couples. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, um, n- nobody's excluded. Exactly. I'm afraid when when it comes <laughs> it's to STIs. It's all equal as it should be. <laughs> it is all equal. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the fact that people don't have insurance and they can't afford to go to mm-hmm. a private gynae. There are some services, there are some services in Malta, um, so basic gynae consultations can be accessed via a referral from a GP. Okay. That is then sent for health centre, so the, so so then the patient goes to health centre to see a, a, a gynecologist, so it could be a trainee, it could be uh, one of the specialists. There is no ultrasound scan at the time. A smear test can be done, however, Mm -hmm. but if she is struggling with pain or painful periods or heavy periods, um, then she would need to be referred for an ultrasound, Okay, have that done, come back to the health centre for the review of the ultrasound, and that could be with a different doctor. Okay. We also have cervical screening, and that is sent to the... There's a letter that's being sent out and you reply whether you want to go for the test or not. Okay, is this between a certain age? Yes, they've screen? started. I'm not sure where we're at with ages, mm-hmm. um, but it's being sent to most of the women. Okay, I think mm-hmm. I think 80s onwards. That's it, because even since October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month as well, I know that they actually screen a certain demographic in Malta yes. as well, yes. but it's just, I think it's from 35 onwards. No, actually, with mammogram, mammogram okay, mm. it's from 50 onwards. 50 onwards, yeah. okay, okay. And that's why we need to check ourselves Absolutely. <laughs> before Absolutely. that and not just leave it like... Absolutely. Yeah. So it's important to self-breast exams, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and if you do feel something, then speak to a doctor. Yeah. Gynees are not specialists in breasts. Yeah, this is the problem I had too. <laughs> Yeah, so basically I had found a lump Mm -hmm. and my previous guy and he just said, oh, just go to one of these um, oncologists. And uh, she did a very thorough breast exam on me every every time I went. And uh, it was quite, quite, when I actually met you and I had an appointment with you, you're like, listen, I'm a guy, (laughs) not a breast doctor, you know, so I ended up getting referred properly. Um, but yeah, I don't think uh, the whole breast cancer conversation as well, even in, in youth and how to check yourself and that men can get it as well. And yeah, the whole conversation is a bit hush hush, I feel. Even before we we're talking about STI, so mm-hmm. and going to the gynae, what do men go or is there a male equivalent of the gynae? And do you know what I mean? Because it's all on the on the women, I feel sometimes or on um, the LGBTIQ community that there is this kind of stigma, even when donating blood, that is like, oh, they're dirty, you know, when, like we're saying, <laughs> a lot of heterosexual men um, seem to be, I think we had one of the highest STI rates in Europe, I think recently, that anyway. We have the highest HIV diagnosis. Oh my God. Yeah. And nobody's talking about it. <laughs> we have the highest HIV diagnosis, yeah. whether it's being diagnosed more than other countries. But yes, I mean, HIV is a thing. Yeah. Thankfully, it is treatable mm-hmm. to the fact t- to a point where it's um, it's undetectable. So, so if you're on on HIV medication, okay. then you the the viral load will be so low that actually you cannot transmit it. Okay. So ag- again, mm-hmm. see, we need a bit of awareness about this. Exactly. It almost feels like oh my god, HIV is a death sentence. It's not. It mm-hmm. changes your life drastically. Yeah. But. 
but there is treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yes, I think even self awareness, um, knowing if or feeling f something wrong, you need to be able to speak up. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully for for women, there is the gynecologist, and as a gynecologist, I feel that women do come for an appointment, even if just like that, uh -huh. you know, just for a routine appointment. Um, but for men. Men don't like to go to the doctor as much, um, even for simple GP appointments. They don't like, th and if they feel something, normally it takes a long time before they speak to someone about yes, that. Yes, it's the ooey culture, but I'll get to it. <laughs> yes, or I, I don't want to know, you know. Like, oh, exactly. Whatever. Um, uh, yeah. So the equivalent is a urologist, but mm -hmm. interestingly, a urologist mostly see pathology so if there's something wrong wrong you don't you don't go to a urologist for a checkup normally exactly, right exactly yeah um but sdi screening should be done by everyone mm -hmm. okay gender sexuality i don't care it needs to be done um if you're sexually active obviously and uh, our services uh, at mater day hospital there's the gu clinic and that's free service it is completely anonymized so all the results on that system are not available for the main system. Oh, okay. okay, so nobody can nobody can check on you, all right? If you've got an ex who's been uh, <laughs> haunting you or something. Um, <laughs> but these things are done. Unfortunately, these yes. things are done. You know, yes, or, yes. Um, can you can you check the result of uh, my 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 brother-in-law? No, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what you want to know. Um, <laughs> but thankfully, with the GU clinic, it's completely anonymized. And you can give a fake name, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you can give a fake name and your phone number. Um, obviously, make sure that when they call you for the results, answer to that fake name. Exactly. Um, but, uh, but yes, it's a very good service, but it's understaffed. And uh, with more awareness, more people accessing, accessing these, these services, obviously there's a longer waiting time. But if you're symptomatic, if you've got symptoms, if you've got bleeding in between periods, if you have bothering, b bothersome discharge that's not normal with, with, with blood, if you've got pain, if you've had sex with someone recently and all of a sudden you've got pelvic pain, um, if you have uh, ulcers, lesions on the vulva. Uh, so if there's these symptoms, they will see you within a, within a day or two, okay? okay. if not immediately. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to know that this service does exist. Obviously, there's the private uh, consultants who, who do the SCI screening. But mm -hmm. yes, yes, the, these services are, are accessible, thankfully, as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amazing. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the experience I had when I because I had never done an SCI test. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. last appointment I had with you, um, I said, OK, let me go do one just to see what, what it's all about. And I went to willingness, like you said, I went to the private practice and it was actually very educational besides, and you know, and she was very calming, like you're saying, very explaining everything, <laughs> which is not an experience I've had. Um but yeah, as in, like you're saying, I basically just gave my name and she gave me the results on WhatsApp. It was a very, very, very easy um, exactly. thing to do. And it wasn't this kind of monstrous thing that we put in our heads of, oh my God, what's going to happen? No, it's it's better that you know. And Absolutely. I think Absolutely. this with our sexual health and everything, it's sometimes it's better that we know, no, that, not that we put it on the back in the back of the room and then we kind of face it many years later, which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what happens most of the time, yeah. Um, do you... When you have patients, when it comes to taking the pill, um, there's there's a huge connection between hormones and mental health, obviously, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so what would you do if you see some effects, if somebody's taking the pill, for example, and they start changing their yeah. personality or their moods goes down? So this is very interesting. Um, when we talk about the pill, when we refer to the pill, mm. We normally refer to the ones that have got two hormones, estrogen mm -hmm. and progesterone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there are various different types of the pill that we've got available and the different hormones. So as a doctor, I should know which one I should prescribe to you mm -hmm. for your condition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you come to me because of irregular cycles, but you don't have acne... Mm -hmm. then I don't need to choose the one that normally we use for acne, mm -hmm. right? So I can choose any of the other ones. All the different hormones actually have got different effects. Okay. Okay. So this is important 
part of medicine that we need to know. Okay. The pill that you mentioned earlier that we normally use to treat acne. Okay, good to know. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. So, um, can I mention brand names? Yes, yes. Okay. Go ahead. So, um, you mentioned Yaz earlier, mm-hmm. okay? So, Yaz, Yasmin, Yasminel, mm-hmm. okay? Um, in Malta, we also got Fridonel, which is similar to, to Yasminel, is the, the generic of that, okay. okay? So, these pills have got the same exact hormones, okay? And these hormones are anti androgenic, so they are against androgens, mm-hmm. okay? Androgens is the male hormones, testosterone. Ah, okay. okay, because if you have higher testosterone, you're prone to have acne, you're going to have more facial hair. Mm. Okay, so this goes hand in hand with PCOS as well. Okay, so I choose one of those mm-hmm. if someone has got a problem with acne, with skin issues. Okay, okay, mm-hmm. if someone doesn't have skin issues, I'm not going to choose one of those, there's no need. Mm-hmm. Okay, from my UK, now this is interesting, from my UK training, okay, from research, yes, has been shown to be the best for PMS. Wow, okay. That's amazing. So I come to Malta <laughs> and I see that most of the women who are on, uh, on Yaz have worse PMS, have got irritability, mm-hmm. have got mood swings mm-hmm. and like, oh, hang on a second, this is not helping you, is it? Right? Exactly, yes. So let's come off it. And I've had, actually I've had clients who had been started on antidepressants by a psychiatrist because of one of these medications. Oh right? my God. Yeah, that happened to me, uh, in fact, because when I went to a psychiatrist, I told him, like, listen, I've been on the pill, like, this is my history, and they did not see that holistically. They're like, okay, just go on fluoxetine, and we'll just take it from there, see you in a few months, bye. So, No, absolutely. So this is why I also take a drug history, because I need to find out what that person has taken, why. Yes, exactly. Why? Mm -hmm. Um, And I always, if if I'm meeting someone new, and they tell me they've been on Yaz, I'm like, okay. So how are you doing on that pill? Because if they're okay, because there are people who are okay. Yeah, right? the lucky ones. <laughs> and, and if they're okay, I'll prescribe the same thing. That's absolutely fine. But if you're not okay, you need to, you need to know that this is not okay and it's okay to speak up. Yes, exactly. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, yeah, so um, the, these group of contraceptives that we're mentioning, they reduce testosterone. Mm-hmm. Testosterone is the libido hormone. Mm. So all of a sudden, you're on contraception, but you're not attracted to your partner. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I think there was a study that uh, contraception actually changes what preferences you have as well in relationships. It was a very interesting study. So you'd actually be attracted to different men or women. (laughs) That's that's true. (laughs) Yes, I have read this research. Um, We can can talk about quirky research and all of that. (laughs) But but also because... If you're on the pill, you don't have ovulation. And okay. ovulation is also what uh, makes you horny. Right? Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. around that time of ovulation is when the woman mm-hmm. feels like she needs to be fertilized. <laughs> <laughs> so, so with the pill, because yeah. we don't have that because mm-hmm. it st- stabilizes your cycle. You don't have that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back to the pill, if someone is struggling with their mental health with all these hormones, um, yes, thankfully there are various options. Right. I like to explain that side effects are very common because side effects are, first of all, you're going to take hormones. Right. If someone walks in on me Mm -hmm. and I get a fright, my body is going to release adrenaline. Exactly. That's a hormone. Mm -hmm. I'm going to react to that hormone. Mm -hmm. Okay. For that split second, my adrenaline glands, lots of adrenaline. I might feel my legs cut off and I don't, can't move and I freeze, I might scream, I might run, okay? So you're reacting to a hormone. Mm -hmm. So now with a pill, you're going to take hormones and your body needs to react to Mm -hmm. those hormones. And everyone reacts differently. As to side effects, so side effects come and go, okay? So a little bit of a headache maybe, Mm -hmm. um, some nausea, some loss of appetite. These are all quite common side effects, Okay, mm-hmm. um, breast size changes. Okay, so these are side effects. But side effects, as I said, they come and go. I mm-hmm. normally explain that in the first month you're going to feel this. Yes, right? yes. And this is a cycle. Mm-hmm. It's not like taking paracetamol for a headache and the headache goes away after a few hours. No, we need to wait a cycle. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's not something that is rushed. Normally, with the second month, your body gets used to it. 
Yeah. Okay. And and you settle into those side effects or they disappear. Mm-hmm. With the third month, your body either l- likes it or not. <laughs> okay. So I, I try to encourage my, my, my clients to see three months. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you're not good with three months, then forget about it. We're going to change. So okay. there's a trial period, basically, that you need to give yourself time yes. to get used to it. But it's, it's not like, oh, ho- take this one, you know. Exactly. It, it, it's not, there, there's a reason why I chose that one. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure all the other specialists do the same. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, because this is what should happen. Okay. But if you don't like it, it's okay to change. This is not like... You're stuck with it forever. It's not like a tattoo. <laughs> You know, you yeah. you know, then you have to do laser and and, and change it over, okay? <laughs> but it's okay to change. Um, mm-hmm. um, going back to contraception with uh, the long acting reversible contraception, okay? Something like like the rod, okay? Yeah. Okay, the rod, please. In Malta, people are referring to it as a chip. <laughs> <laughs> you can pay for it. Dot, Stop can you do the chip for me? Like chip, you're not going to just scan it. You're like, not like a dog. So oh my God. It's just a little device that really uses hormones. It's a plastic, soft plastic device. Um, chip. Like a chip. <laughs> so now when they come and ask you about the chip, I'm like, I know what they're talking about. But there's Maltese. Um, so, so yeah, rod. Let's try and get the conversation going is uh, the rod. Um, and it's getting more and more popular. A little device that's fitted in your arm. And obviously the coil is right. Does um, it hurt the rod to put in? Or? No. No? Okay, no. that's interesting. Okay. Honestly, the anxiety that women have when I'm fitting it. Oh, no, no, no. And I fit it. Uh, is that it? Is that it? Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Like, no. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but people think it's like a big procedure, like an operation. It's not. And you don't see it. You don't, you don't see it. You don't feel it. But you, if you press, you look for it, you find it. Okay. It's soft. Okay. Um, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. Mm. But the coil, it might come down. It might dislodge. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that, that person might decide which one to go for on the basis of I don't want something in my uterus mm. or even if your uterus cannot cannot accept the coil because if you have a abnormally shaped uteri mm-hmm. okay or fibroid or something I cannot put the coil in um, but with, with these long acting reversible contraceptions larks in short <laughs> <laughs> larks these larks um, because in Malta you pay for these yeah mm-hmm if I fit one and you come to me after three months, like, oh, doctor, can you remove it? Because I don't like it. Mm. I'm mean, like, no. Mm. Hang on a second. Let's talk about this because it needs to settle in your body. And I'll try to convince you to keep it in because it was expensive to put in in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. As with the pill or the vaginal ring. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you don't like it, don't buy the next one. Exactly. Yeah. So it's almost like let's test mm-hmm. out these hormones on you mm-hmm. um, and see whether you like them or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like them, it's okay. You don't need to be forced to take the pill. Mm-hmm. Obviously, when you go to the gynae and they explain to you why you, you need to take the pill as hormonal treatment, mm-hmm. okay. Once that explanation is there, then obviously the, the patient will understand, okay, I do need it. Mm-hmm. You know, so so it's important to communicate. For sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and you mentioned before, because um, I think there is a bit of a misconception slash it's very confusing. Because um, with the concept of pill, usually there is that period of time where you don't take it and then you get a fake period sort of yes. thing. Um, and a lot of people think that it affects your fertility in the long term because you're not ovulating. <laughs> So no. <laughs> I've heard this many times. Okay. So since you're putting your body like your body hasn't been ovulating for the past 10 years, for example, if you're mm. on the pill, um, some people think that when they actually want to have kids that they're not going to be able to because they've been stopping that process. My basically. goodness. OK, so, yes, I don't know why, but this comes up a lot. It does. It does. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? <laughs> Who are you talking to? Um so the pill actually is protected, protecting your ovaries. When we talk about ovarian functions, ovaries are, f- are constantly doing something. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. As we speak, as our listeners are listening to this, <laughs> okay, those that are not on the pill, okay. So the ovaries within them have got all these tiny follicles, 
that we were born with, okay? Mm -hmm. And these follicles are at a different stage of maturation. There is a follicle stimulating hormone that is released by the brain. Mm -hmm. And that stimulates these follicles and uh, the most mature one, the largest one, then ovulates. Okay? So the egg comes off. Mm -hmm. All right? So every month when there is this ovulation happening, and if you see it, honestly, I've a couple of times I've managed to see this when we were operating. And it's it's, it's like, a, it's it's amazing. It's like a tiny volcano, right? <laughs> it's true. So, so, so the ovary almost like opens up these little tiny pocket and the egg pu puffs out. Wow, okay. It's fascinating. That process is causing a little bit of inflammation. There's damage. Mm. Okay? Okay. So cellular damage. Every month we have damage on the ovaries, okay? When there's a damaged cell, if the body doesn't recognize it as a damaged abnormal cell and doesn't get rid of it, because this is how the body works, okay? It protects us all the time. If there's a damaged cell, recognize it, kills it off, okay? It's an internalized process, it's amazing. When that system fails and the damaged cell survives, that damaged cell keeps on dividing. And that is what becomes a tumor, a cancer. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So cancer is always from damage, from inflammation. And how can you catch that? So you're saying you'd feel that there's a bit, would there be pain or you just... But, but these are cells. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. Yeah. Okay. So this is how cancer is. Okay. This is a process of cancer mm -hmm. because of damage. Right. Mm -hmm. So going back to your ovaries, your ovaries, the ovaries, <laughs> <laughs> going back to ovaries. Um, when there's this repeat damage, okay, every month, then our overall risk of, of rain cancer is 1% for a lifetime. Okay. And is this related to HPV that we're talking about? No. Or, no. Okay. No. Okay. That's very interesting because HPV is just for. Not just, I misspoke there. So HPV affects surface um, tissue. Okay, so mm -hmm. cervix, skin of the vulva, skin of the vagina, skin uh, around the anus and penis. Okay. okay. So HPV effect, effect damages mm. those cells. Okay, so it causes damage. Damage can long term lead to cancer. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. When someone is on the pill, ovulation does not happen. So you're not getting that damage. So you're not getting that damage. Mm. So someone who's on the pill will reduce the risk of ovarian cancer actually by half. Yeah, absolutely. So when you talk about, oh, because the pill increases... When I talk about this, and, and there is benefits to being on the pill, okay? And for someone who doesn't bleed, so if someone does not have regular periods and that endometrium, the lining is not shed, all the cells become damaged and there is a risk of uterine cancer. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the pill is actually protecting you mm -hmm. from ovarian cancer and uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those ovaries are nice and calm and quiet. When you stop the pill, they're going to resume function. Okay, so if your body is working as it should, they will resume function. And if you have, for example, polycystic ovaries, would it actually help you become regular once you stop them or no? Your body will just... It's different. You cannot mm. predict that because with polycystic ovarian syndrome, the actual polycystic ovary and associated with insulin resistance, um, there is a reduced ovulation rate. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean there's no ovulation because, because that's incorrect. Mm -hmm. If we say someone is not ovulating, that means they're not fertile. Exactly. And you cannot yeah. tell someone who has got PCOS that they cannot get pregnant because they'll be not using contraception <laughs> and then suddenly become pregnant. And maybe it's a surprise, right? Exactly. Especially in a country like Malta where abortion doesn't exist, where there's an unplanned pregnancy and then all of a sudden you have to make means to continue the pregnancy, keep the... And it's a bit of a nightmare, right? For sure, yes. When we talk about those women who stop taking the pill and the period never comes, okay? So this is post-pill amenorrhea. Amenorrhea is no period. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some people talk about this, oh, after, the period, after the pill, my period doesn't come, okay? If it's polycystic ovarian syndrome, we need to check. But... There is a 1%, oh, always 1%, See, this is why it's easy. There's a 1% chance that that person could be in early menopause. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with 
women, 1% risk of early menopause. 1%. Mm. High or low, it's 1%. Okay, uh, roughly 1%. So if you take 100 women who are on the pill, one of them, without you knowing, statistically is going to be in early menopause. Mm. Okay. Okay. But because you're taking the pill, that woman will still have function and withdrawal bleeds and it's fake. Okay. And that woman is going to be the one that doesn't have periods after stopping the pill. It is a fake period. Okay. Because we're externally stimulating the uterus and the way it works. So the two hormones we mentioned at the beginning, estrogen, progesterone, estrogen thickens the lining, progesterone thins it. Okay, so that's why they're in balance. And the whole reason why there is estrogen is to give us a cycle. Mm. Because when it was originally invented, it was like, okay, <laughs> they can be on contraception, but they have to have a cycle so that they're not like extradicted, I don't know, They're not different think, from the rest of the population. Uh, I heard that in America when they did invent the contraceptive pill, um, it was a man who invented it, apparently, yeah, and they, he put in the placebo pills to actually get it approved by the FDA in the court so that they're actually seeing blood, oh, there is a period, so it's normal. Yes. So yes. in reality, we don't really need to wait for that <laughs> placebo period, apparently. Yes. So when you <laughs> take... Exactly. Oh, yeah. um, there's many stories, one about the Pope as well. <laughs> Um, it's always about men, isn't it? Um, so when you're taking the hormones, okay, so when someone's taking the hormones, there's a stable level of these hormones. Once there's a withdrawal, then it's going to bleed. Mm-hmm. Okay. So whilst you're on them, you should not bleed. So technically, if someone's on the pill, they can go back to back. So skipping placebo, skipping the break, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. skipping that hormone-free interval Mm -hmm. and not have a period. Mm -hmm. Okay? I also find that women who do this, sometimes there's breakthrough bleeding because obviously there's still estrogen and it feels like it needs to come. Uh, Break, okay? Take the break and and allow that period. But, but, But yes, you're right. So you don't technically need to take the placebo. You don't. You don't have to have a period, you know? If it's controlled with hormones, it's okay. It's okay to not have a period. And these other long-acting reversible contraceptions that we were talking about previously, um, like the like the coil and, and the rod, that's how they work because they release a hormone every single day. Mm-hmm. It's not cyclical, it's continuous. So there's no period. And that's a good life. Mm-hmm. And do you need to, because I heard even with the pill that you're not immediately safe from getting pregnant. So when you take the pill, obviously, <laughs> I've heard many things. You need to wait, um, for example, three months. What? So it's actual. <laughs> what? Who are yeah. you talking? <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of talking to. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. No, um, no, no. If you stop the pill within the first five days, you've got cover after two. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. Okay. So, yes. So the way it works, if you take... I tell them after a week, just to be super, super safe, and we're immortal. Um, uh, after seven days of mm-hmm. taking the pill, ovulation is suppressed. Okay, mm-hmm. so technically, you are uh, you covered from the pregnancy point of view. You should still use contraceptives, obviously, if you're on the pill. So that's that's should be two on one, and you're safe. If, and, uh, do you know what? I have some clients who are, are adamant to do that. Okay. Yeah, they use condom and still pull out. And they're on the pill, okay? Because because contraceptive failures do exist. Yes. Thankfully, very, very tiny mm-hmm. percentage. Yes. But if someone is, like, being responsible and actively mm-hmm. avoiding a pregnancy, yes. if they caught out by something, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes there's condom failure, sometimes... Without knowing, you know, we all get sick, we take antibiotics, some some maybe new antibiotics, we don't know that can yeah. interact with, mm-hmm. with with the pill. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there are people who are super, super careful. Um, and I have experienced that in Malta. In the UK, it's not like that. When I was in the UK, if someone is, contra- is on contraception, if they're using the pill, it's just the pill. and uh, And with ejaculation internally and all of that right 
Yes, absolutely, because they're using it as contraception. Mm-hmm. And but if they forget to take it, what happens then? <laughs> If they forget to take it, they can yeah. go to the um, clinic mm-hmm. and they get emergency contraception. Okay, the morning yeah. after pill, like you know. uh, or 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 the coil. Yes, okay. but these are things that are f- easily available. More, I I talk about the UK because that's where I was trained. So yeah. obviously, I'm familiar with that. Um, but yes, I saw from your face that uh, see, this is very normal. Yeah, in Malta, contraception is not relied on as contraception. Exactly, it's almost like a backup. Yes, for that woman. Listen, I really don't want to get pregnant. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I'm dating. I'm meeting men, and I'm still using condoms, but I'm protecting myself. I don't want to get yeah, pregnant. Yeah, because we don't have that. I don't. T- I've heard stories where friends try to get the morning after pill in some pharmacies, and they were denied. And there, it's this whole thing of okay, I really plucked up the courage to go, yeah. and they denied me that right. And um, even in cases of rape, so okay, you weren't taking contraceptives. You're you're single. And you get pregnant. Yeah. And that's non consensual, of course, but um, unfortunately, due to the laws in Malta and men deciding on women's bodies, which is so funny to me because if you had to think about it, vice versa, <laughs> if Parliament was full of women <laughs> passing laws on men's bodies, it's like, no, that would never happen. <laughs> Of course not. Of course not. <laughs> you You're know. talking sci-fi here. So, yeah, yeah. No, it's just, not. you know, it's it's unbelievable because we don't even have... I think that's why we don't trust the contraceptives because it's like, okay, what the hell do I do then if I do get pregnant? You know, do I have to go abroad? Do I have to go online and find... You know, there, there are some women that get into very dangerous situations yeah. trying to do at-home at abortions. I've yes. heard stories as well before. So, yes, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Not all men are like that. Not all men. No, 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 <laughs> Not all men are like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Disclaimer, you know, there's some yeah, exactly. some some men who are, uh, yes, acknowledging all women's rights as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but absolutely, you're right. Um, accessing any information, I mean, at least at least we got some information in Malta now about. But these things happen. Abortion still happens as a Malta. Um, but people are afraid. People are afraid of the repercussions, of the legal, illegal repercussions, both to specialists or to the, the, the person mm-hmm. um, buying those tablets. Um, there are the uh, FPAS, so the Pregnancy Advisory Services. Um, so women can access all these uh, these websites to see where they can speak to someone, where they can get help. But unfortunately, I've seen repercussions. And there are repercussions that we don't talk about. Um, apart from the fact that it does affect the woman's body if it's done wrong. And I've seen a couple of times where women almost, almost, almost lost their life. Yeah. Because they're scared to speak until it's too late. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's a bit of a a, a huge topic, taboo topic as well. <laughs> yeah. um, we can yeah. we can spend a whole another session talking about this, Sophie. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yes, I mean, morning after pill is accessible in Malta. It has been labelled as the morning after pill. Mm-hmm. This is emergency contraception. Okay. Maybe we need to start changing the vocabulary, okay? When I was in the UK, it was always emergency contraception. And there was the morning after pill. There was the coil. And, you know, there's the pill that you take after five days or up to five days. Because people think that you can have sex with ejaculation internally. And it's okay. We'll take the morning after pill. That's not, this is not contraception. Mm. It's emergency contraception. Because I've seen failed morning after pills. I know, right? And I've also seen people who abuse morning after pill. Mm. Oh yes, because uh, um, we have uh, we have sex and no, it finishes inside. And but I took the morning after pill. Don't no, don't don't do that because you, you don't have to. Why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. You know, because it's being talked about as the morning after pill, because this is the contraception that you use. But it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. And I also had someone who would buy these morning after pills from abroad, 
And she'd, uh, you, she'd take one every single time. She'd have sex, obviously, the morning after, <laughs> right? And then she presents to me with a regular bleeding. I'm like, okay, but what's going on? And I say, are you taking any t- tablets from me? Oh, nothing. I said, let me let me check a pregnancy test. Oh, I can't be pregnant, show me. I said, uh, but you're having sex. And she told me, oh, no, no, no. I take the morning after pill. After every single time. Okay. <laughs> so it's not the morning after pill. You don't take it the morning after. This is not how this pill and does it's it not like, a contraception. Does it shock your body every time you take it's it? It's a high dose of <laughs> the normal pill. Okay. 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 So it's not good to take it every single time. No, no. And you can only okay. take it. You can only take it once a cycle. Mm. And the way okay. it works, it delays ovulation. So if there was, if you had intercourse and there was condom failure or you know, whatever happened, rape even, um, and it's around ovulation, what happens is it. If you take it, it will delay ovulation so that the sperm doesn't uh, fertilize that egg and it's not available for for the egg to be fertilized and the egg is then ovulated is made available later on okay so bypassing all of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that's how the morning after pill works there is also the copper coil that is used as an emergency contraception okay i don't know i don't know much we don't about talk it. about that no we don't we don't well. talk about this so the copper coil, the way the copper coil works, it is toxic to anything living inside the uterus. Okay, that's how it works, that's contraception. It is not hormonal, it doesn't affect your hormones, it doesn't affect your psycho. But if there is a fertilized egg, it cannot implant because of the mm. copper environment. So if someone comes after condom failure, after rape, I can fit a copper coil mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. because it's going to prevent implantation. Now, this is where it's vague and grey because in Malta, some people are talking about the copper coil being abortifacent. If someone is pregnant, I cannot fit a copper coil and kill the baby. It doesn't work like that. So you cannot you cannot do an abortion with the copper coil. Okay, so it is still legal to fit a copper coil. But if you believe that life starts at fertilization, so the fertilized egg is an alive pregnancy, obviously this is going to interfere with that process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it it's where you ethically believe the uh, commencement of life is. Okay, whether it's fertilization, conception, all of that. Um, and I do explain this to my, to my patients about the copper coil. I have the copper coil, it's not a problem. Um, sometimes there are women who cannot take hormones for one reason or another. And uh, the copper coil would be the only option for them. Okay. Um, I don't like it when someone comes uh, books an appointment for the copper coil, just like that, without mm. me even knowing them. First of all, I need to make sure it's the correct thing for you. I need to have a full consultation because... Maybe there are other options that would benefit you because of other other reasons. And then we can hit two birds with one stone. Mm-hmm. But also I would need to do an ultrasound to make sure that the copper, that the coil can be fitted inside your uterus. And the copper, because it creates a toxic environment, it can make your periods heavier. So if someone who comes with a six-day period... Mm-hmm. This is going to be a nightmare for them if I fit a copper coil, okay? Because mm-hmm. it can make periods heavier. Someone with a three-day period going to a five or six, yeah, it's manageable. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's still manageable. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but, but yes, indeed. Um, rape victims. Uh, the situation in Malta: um, rape is reported to the police, and then the the patient, the victim, is seen at the hospital within the gynae department. I've heard some stories, though, that people who are brave enough to actually go to the police, they were like, oh, it was your fault because of what you were wearing, or, yeah, you know. Um, yes, this is all um, sad. It's sad. I mean, we can we can discuss this a little bit off topic, but, I mean, even even the uh, the definition of rape, and I had to unlearn a lot of things when I came to Malta, because the law is different. Absolutely. Yeah, in the UK, rape is any penetra- penetration of the vagina with anything. Mm-hmm. Anything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Could be a finger, it could be a sausage, it could be a penis. Mm-hmm. Okay. In Malta, that's not the case. Okay, so rape 
is penis and vagina or penis and anus. Um, so yeah, so so someone is. I still want to use the word rape. But if you're um, lesbian, for example, you can still rape another woman, you know? So that's not, in Malta, that's not considered rape. No, if there is, if there is um, unconsented for even fingering, that's not rape. That's carnal knowledge. Yeah, what? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yes. So, so this is why some women uh, do not report their rape. And rape is very, it's common. Rape is common, 25%. And is there an, an anonymous way that people can report that? Or no, they have to physically go up to the police and make a report? You need to make a report. Oh my God. So. You need to make a report because if it's, oh. and it is, and it's then, you know, it's led by the police. And uh, it depends how long ago the rape happened, whether there is physical trauma, um, which then obviously needs to be examined by the gynae. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then there's a forensic expert. Sometimes there's photos taken. Obviously, there's, there's samples that are taken. Quite a process. Then. It is a big process. Mm -hmm. It is a big process. And all of this is done at uh, uh, the gynae department. So in the same room where we see emergencies. Yeah. Okay. So if someone has collapsed because they have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, for example, and there's a rape, um, obviously the rape victim will... If yeah. she's stable, we'll have to wait in the waiting area with the police. And this is at Mater Day, we're saying. That's at Mater Day. Can they go privately as well? No, the, no they can't. Okay, well, no, I no. didn't know that. Okay. No, there is no, there is no facilities um, in the UK. There, there is separate units that are mm. not in the hospital. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like a little room somewhere, mm -hmm. like a little health center. Exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, that's not associated with anything like a little clinic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where there's a nice environment where there's uh, the the victim can be made comfortable as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, because this is not a nice situation. Following the the assault that they went through. Um, uh, that's the thing, though. Like in in Malta, so. Okay, go through all this. Is there some like mental health or psychology services that come after that happens? Because obviously you're dealing with this huge trauma as well. It's not just physical, it's mental, right? <laughs> <laughs> um. We're trying, we're, we've got an okay service with mm. baby loss mm -hmm. and that should be automatic. Okay. You know? um, but I'm, I'm not aware of... Any free service. We need to talk about this more. We need to talk about this more. Yeah. And and starting the conversation with mm -hmm. great awareness and, and mm -hmm. maybe services yeah. would be available. Exactly. Yeah. Even for miscarriages, there's a whole conversation of having leave to mourn miscarriages as well, you know. So there is, there's a lot. There's a lot that we need to... <laughs> You're it's opening all the cans all of worms. Of <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, so... Uh, finishing this off, is there anything you'd like to say to the audience or how they can visit you um, at your clinic and uh, any tips? <laughs> My goodness me. Um, uh, I, maybe you can uh, leave some information about if they want to contact me. Yes. Um, even if they don't want to visit. Um, uh, I also do video consultations if someone wants to speak to me um, or, or send me a note a question or something I'm I'm accessible as much as possible even though I'm very busy um, um, don't be afraid to go to the gynae don't be afraid to say no because it's important okay um, it's okay to say no and sometimes sometimes I have clients who come uh, uh, we kind of split the session mm -hmm. because if they're not comfortable the first time with me to do the examination and they say no, it's fine, it's okay. Um, and as as much as possible, you need to be able to speak openly because it's an intimate subject. Um, I'd rather know about everything mm -hmm. so I can safely advise you because if I don't know about something, I might assume. Mm -hmm. And when I assume I make mistakes. You might misdiagnose depending on Absolutely. the lack of information we're giving you. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. one of the answers I absolutely hate is normal. Mm. What is normal? What is normal? <laughs> so if I ask, if I, uh, we haven't talked about vaginal discharge and infections, but mm -hmm. that all goes to, to it, it has to do with vaginal hygiene. Mm -hmm. So when I question how do you, how do you take care of yourself? How do you bathe? 
Ah, normal. Hang on a second, because your norm is not my normal. Are you but using any perfumed products? Exactly. So there's this whole conversation exactly. of like vaginas shouldn't smell. Oh my God, they smell. And the whole pH subject. Or we can talk about that next time. What do you exactly. think? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll yes. talk about that next time. Yes, yeah, I'm for sure. would be very happy to. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs> Thank you.